Tonight, I'm just going to uh, very, very briefly go over the wine. Uh, we're doing a rosé, and if you remember a Cremant, this is it, the Willem. Uh, this is a Cremant from uh, Alsace. And if you remember from the champagne session, a Cremant is um, kind of a, a minimal step down from a champagne because it follows all the designated rules in France for production, proper production of champagne, but it is an AOC outside of champagne. There are actually seven areas that push uh, 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 fix, prepare, prepare, ferment, uh, cremant. And also is one of them. In fact, when I was uh, looking up this wine, I discovered that 50% of the cremant in France is actually produced in the Alsus area. This particular cremant is 100% uh, Pinot Noir. So you have a little fuller flavor. Uh, it's not quite as much minerality, of course, based upon the, um, uh, on the terroir. Now, another thing was interesting. I brought the cheese today, which was a goat cheese, the one that was recommended by um, uh, St. James. Now, one thing when you're buying a wine or you're deciding what to do, do you want the food to complement the wine or do you want the wine to complement the food? And usually it's two different approaches. Also depends at what point you're serving the wine. Are you doing it as an aperitif? Are you doing it as dessert? Or you're doing it with the main meal? Now they picked a goat cheese and it has a chalky, of course, you know, the uh, chopped kind of rind. It's very um, definite in taste. The one I chose was the B-R-I-L-L-I-A-T Savaram which is, they call it a triple cream. It's like almost a quadruple cream. It's like sticking your finger in it and having butter. It's absolutely wonderful. So basically it's the fat in the Savaran that complements and works with the acidity and the apple and the raspberry and the strawberry that's in the rosé. Whichever you like, if you want it to challenge the wine, goat cheese is perfect. If you want it to kind of round out and, and and make it just, I don't even know the word, just yummier, um, I would choose the Savaram because it's a high, high fat content. So um, if there's any questions, uh, we'll do that another time and enjoy Michael, we all will. Thank you very much. Well, without further ado, I'm going to start Jean's presentation. This will just take me a minute to set up. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't know. I can't hear oh, <laughs> But it was on a second ago. Well, maybe that's nothing's being said. If nobody's talking and everybody else's mic, uh, mic is muted. There we go. We'll try this again.
We are in the zoo meeting right now. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I don't know about audio. Is there audio? <laughs> yeah, there's audio. It's you very hear? soft. I'll turn mine up next. Yeah. All the way up. And he said the only other, uh, it's on the right thing. <laughs> No, it's not. Um, no, that's not right. Let's see. Mm -mm. Was anybody able, able to hear the presentation? Yes, no, no, yes, no. Let's check the audio here. All right, I'm going to try it again now and nod your head or shake your head, depending on whether you can hear it or not. We'll try it again. Can you hear it now?
Can you hear it now? Still no, Judith. Thank you. No. Rats. You can start here, begin to hear him, and then he goes away. Can you hear it now? How about now? How about now? Can you hear it now?
in the last talks at least i did i hope you did too and in our last presentation welcome back union francaise members i'm so happy to be with you again for this third and last talk of the series devoted to the art of uh, publicity advertising. We've had a lot of fun in the last talks, at least I did, I hope you did too. And in our last presentation, if you remember, we covered one of the most well-known period running from the 1930s to the early 80s, I would say. But today we will dive into the creative illustrators and graphis, graphic artists. Uh, spreading from 1980 about to the present. In the early 80s, advertising actually became a cultural phenomenon and the poster created the event really, it was commercial. And um, it's interesting to see that more and more um, the posters are gonna concentrate on the product itself. Uh, the 80s also marked a new stage in the aesthetics of the poster. It was commercial, often in its element of the campaign, and as such, uh, it was very largely uh, indebted to the commercial film or to To references to pop culture, which France, you have to be aware of that, uh, was not used to. America has always been keen on pop culture, but in France, there has always been this uh, elitist um, and disparaging um, idea that pop culture was lower, that there was the high culture and low culture. And so pop culture was never really part of our world. And advertising allowed it to come into the households. There were also a bunch of wonderful illustrators who emerged um, at this time. Not they had not been working before, but they really, their style, uh, the way they handled uh, the image, the components of the image, the uh, composition, the colors, the references to pop culture really worked at the time. And those people, uh, we're gonna go into uh, depth uh, with their work. Um, also, what is interesting is institutional communication, uh, such as state, local authorities, the city, public services, experienced a, a particular development at the end of the 80s. You remember there was a social socialist government with Mitterrand, um, uh, Get, being the president in 1981. So uh, there was a very important, um, I would say, interest in trying to get messages through to the large uh, audience and public. And those messages were not only commercial, they could be um, institutional, they could be health related, they could be um, vote related. So um, advertising and visuals became a big deal in the 1980s. So you remember that throughout this presentation, I will, um, I will talk about uh, the theory of semiotics. And for the last time, I'd like to remind every single one of you that the study of signs and symbols uh, and their use or their interpretation is called semiotics. And the fathers of semiotic analysis or saussure and Charles Pierce. Uh, the idea that everything that is around us, should there be words or sounds or images uh, mean something that represents something. There are sometimes other microcosm of, um, of a society. They sometimes refer to symbols to myths, to legends, and this is what we do when we analyze pictures. So let's move on without further ado to 
the 80s and the commercial and cultural trend. I'm gonna start off with one little image. Um, I couldn't find a good quality image and I apologize for that, for the one on the right. But as you can see, uh, the end is uh, the centerpiece of this commercial for a Volkswagen um, small vehicle called Polo. Um, it was meant to be a revolution because Polo was quite small, easy to park, a good engine, of course, since it's Volkswagen. But the idea was we had to sell it according to French terms. And this is what I was mentioning earlier on, the idea that they needed to uh, refer to um, a French culture while selling uh, foreign products. So in this case, um, it might be a stretch for anyone to think of the end as a seller for a car, the end being not quite fast. You might think of a Jaguar or Leopard or a Puma, but not so much of an end, but there is a reason. If you look at the uh, catchphrase on the right, les cigales vont enfin pouvoir se payer la fourmi, uh, there's a wonderful pun. So you probably remember Aesop's uh, fable, the one, the grasshopper and the ant, which uh, Jean de La Fontaine adapted in French and called the cicada and the ant. And in this fable, um, the story goes um, that the ant has been uh, really working hard throughout the winter in order to amass and um, get a uh, stock of food uh, for the bad season, uh, for the, yeah, for the season, for the bad season. So she's been working all summer long, I'm sorry. And uh, the cicada or the grasshopper has been prancing and dancing all around and singing. And when the fall comes and the winter comes, she knocks at the ant's door and asks her for help. She needs food. She needs uh, help because she has not been able to foresee the future. And the ant tells her off and tells her that she should have worked instead of dancing. So the morale uh, of this story, um, the morality of this story is that um, you should really pay attention to what you do so that the future is better for you. Well, this is exactly what you do then if you do the parallel with purchasing a Volkswagen uh, and you put money aside to purchase a good car, then you won't have any problems. While if you were to decide on a, a less reliable car, then you'll have problems. I really like the pun. Um, finally, grasshoppers or cicadas can afford the ant. Polo was at the time the uh, nickname uh, the Ant, that, that vehicle. Uh, so I think um, that is a wonderful way to fuse uh, not only uh, a staple of uh, French uh, poetry with Jean de La Fontaine and uh, at the same time, um, the quality of Volkswagen. Um, once again, the 80s were keen on using animals, uh, figures, drawn from pop culture. Um, we have the same uh, type of um, allegiance to pop culture with uh, Luz du Cru, which was a brand for pasta. They used ETs, uh, extraterrestrials or Martians. They had a whole series of using pop culture uh, in order to sell pasta to usually kids. Um, so there is this back and forth between a high culture and low culture, as I was mentioning before, which is quite interesting. Um, so I'm gonna leave it, uh, leave it at that for this part. And I'm gonna move on to one of the most important group of the time, a group of graphic designers claiming author status actually, which has had some influence in the French and international graphic scene and design world. The three founders met actually uh, during the student movement of 1968 in the popular workshop number three. Um, it's actually, um, their work has been actually influenced by this political trend. Um, they begin to work for the fight for the end of the Vietnam War and for the visual identity of the Communist Party um, and the unions 
uh, the communist unions in Paris, the CGT, and a poster campaign for uh, many uh, left uh, leftist parties. From 1978 on, Grappus had had the opportunity to exhibit in important exhibition halls in Paris, such as the Grand Palais, Le Musée de l'Affiche, or Amsterdam, or uh, even um, Aspen, Colorado, and Montreal in the Musée d'Art Contemporain, Canada. So they produce famous posters and influence actually the uh, younger generations with their innovative and uh, committed ethics. So let's look at their work, which is quite interesting. Um, but first I have a quick picture on the group. So um, as I say, it was created in 1970, the group from left to right. So you have uh, François Mir with a moustache who retired actually in uh, 71. Then down you have Michel Robledo. Then you have uh, the woman, Evelyn Deltombe. Then you go up again on the right and you find um, Pierre Bernard. And the last one with the Mickey uh, sweater is Gérard Paris Clavel. Uh, they will be joined later on in the group in 1966 by two other artists, uh, Alex Jordan and Jean-Paul Bachelet. So this group really affirms his intention to change life and they will strive to develop in the same dynamic graphic research and political, social and cultural commercials. So that's a great fusion. Um, a few words about Grappus, the name. The, the name Grappus actually is a contraction of a 68 res insult, um, Stalinist scoundrel. I could maybe translate it that way. Krapul Stalinian and the word graphic. So it's a combination of the two words. So look at this, uh, these two posters. Uh, it's quite interesting. On the one hand, uh, on the left, you have Retour à la Normale. And on the other hand, you have on the left, you have Sois jeune et tais-toi. Um, so both, it seems like it's a catch-22 position for, position for the youth. Um, on the one hand, if you uh, go back into the ranks and you stop uh, rioting in the street, as in May 1968, to show your uh, discontent with the system, whether it be educational or political. Uh, so if you go back into the ranks, you become like a sheep and you go back to normalcy and no progress will be done. So on the one hand, you have a green future, which is not that green. And on the other hand, the youth is banned from speaking. There is some kind of censorship, which you could see the um, shadow of De Gaulle, um, very uh, recognizable here, which seems, that, which seems to say um, the regime that De Gaulle had in place uh, was actually against the youth. And as you remember, De Gaulle uh, will uh, decide to throw the towel and resigned after May 68 because he, he thought that it was not um, a country he wanted to lead anymore. The youth had taken too much power, wanted to express themselves in a way he didn't fit, uh, think appropriate. So there is this kind of danger uh, that mutes the youth, uh, that forces them to silence uh, in a quite um, aggressive way with this really solid red. Um, the catchphrase that you could find, Sois jeune et toi, is an adaptation of, um, I would say, machist um, saying that is being used against girls which is sois belle et tais-toi, be beautiful and please be quiet. So meaning that the only thing we're asking for girls prior to the 60s was to be beautiful and be trophy wives uh, and not express their opinion. So the idea that the youth here is using an um, anti-feminist slogan or an anti-woman slogan is very revealing of the atmosphere that was that of the 60s, which was a time where uh, people couldn't really express themselves. And when the government seems to have 
controlled the media and censorship. We may moving on to another poster by Grappus, which is the child in industrial industrialized world. Uh, you could see that everything that makes a child a child is uh, care. Um, careless, uh, the fact that he's carefree, excuse me, the fact that he's happy and almost um, naive is a little bit tarnished by the fact that there's so many things happening in the world with industrialization, with satellites, with um, the urbanization. So you could see skyscrapers here, you could see satellites, you could see that the world is going very fast, planes here. So the world is changing around this child and the child might um, no longer be able to play like a clown with the big nose. And I think this is quite of a clash between um, this beautiful naivety that you see in the eyes of this child and what is going around him. Will he be able to, to survive this chaotic world? This poster again is um, geared towards uh, making the city better. Once again, a very, uh, social um, endeavor by Grappus, que vi la ville soit belle. So obviously here you could see um, the colors, uh, the accents of some kind of a, a political or at least politically engaged party, the red, the black, this is touching um, political um, 1930s uh, poster making, almost communist. There's some kind of a definitely a leftist um, feel to this poster, as you, you could feel. Um, the idea that um, uh, Aubervilliers, which is a suburbs of Paris, uh, was the victim, of course, of uh, heavy building, building social, um, social housing, um, and those big skyscrapers, those big built all buildings that were built in order to accommodate the waves of immigration in the late 70s and 80s were kind of denaturing uh, the area. Aubervilliers was uh, very much nature at the time, woods, and they had to be cut down in order to have those uh, concrete um, and uh, totally dehumanizing uh, buildings uh, set in place. So. Once again, will there be a way for Aubervilliers to be beautiful again? Uh, this is very dubious here, specifically when the presence of a black cat uh, comes up as if you were crossing. And you, you see how the cat is uh, a little bit on the left of the image as if he was just passing through. Uh, and as you know, with the urban legend or the, uh, the proverb of the saying, that when you come across a black cat, this is bad luck. Um, there are some double entendre here that uh, despite the fact that they're rooting for the city of Aubervilliers to be better, it's very unlikely that it wouldn't. And as we know now, this is what happened. Another poster um, is for Le Secours Populaire, uh, which helps people in need, the needy. Um, so, mondialisant la solidarité, pas la misère. Right? What needs to become global is solidarity, not uh, poverty or um, living under the, yes, under uh, what is uh, acceptable in a democra democratic uh, society. So, um, I really like that. I really like those colors. There's, uh, of course, the presence of uh, blue, white, and red, meaning this is our national endeavor to stop misery, to stop people from being in, in need uh, and to helping each other. Secours Populaire Francais also with the map of the world on the right uh, informs you that this is an international behavior when we are actually welcoming immigrants on our soil. And um, uh, there is some kind of childlike look to this writing, which seems to be handmade. Uh, hand drawn uh, because once again it starts with the kids. So um, all those posters that they did for the Secours Populaire have this feel to it. And here are three of them all together, uh, all um, exhorting people um, to act 
Latin, you can see aide nous agissons, help us uh, act, let's do something. Um, so there is this idea that all together with all our, our diversity, uh, which is symbolized here by the many colors uh, or the, the map of the world, uh, we can do something if only we want it, if only we get committed. I really like those posters because they not only um, were disseminated throughout the city and you couldn't help but get that feel of optimism and uh, action-driven um, art uh, with all these colors, but it also was a way to make the Secours Populaire a little bit more dynamic at, at the time because it had, it had, it had been the victim of uh, almost um, a cliche that it was not cool um, to be part or to be a volunteer in this organization. At the time, there were many other organizations that were emerging in the, in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, specifically towards immigrants that finally um, uh, France was forgetting its own uh, mission to help um, locals, to help uh, people, city dwellers. Um, so it, it, was, it was really important also to cater to the, the needs of uh, families that had been uh, left uh, in the margin. Another art that I would like to introduce you to was a creator of posters since 1962, Alain Le Carnac, and he defines himself as a poster artist. Uh, he really uses the term artist. He wants to be put uh, uh, on the same level uh, with uh, painters. He's very engaged images with a, a simple and bare style strike truly, and they challenge the critical spirit of, of the passerby. Um, let's look at this one, for example, for Amnesty International. Um, quelque part, partout, somewhere, everywhere. Um, oppression is everywhere, as you could see here. So there is this helmet, uh, reminds us of the Nazi helmet, um, um, or a military helmet uh, made of barbed wire which is so aggressive. Uh, and all the people uh, who are a prisoner inside seem to be all the same. They don't have an identity. They're losing their identity and their singularity. Uh, and this is all done. This is what is striking about this image. This is all done on a wonderful blue, lightly cloudy sky as if everything was going on. So I think the message here to get is on the surface of things, everything seems to be right, or at least on your side of the world, everything seems to be right where around the world oppression is striking. I really like this and I'm sure you will agree with me that um, there is a Magritte-esque or Magritte-like quality to this work. Another poster that Le Carnac uh, came up with is um, the um, call for uh, the warning, I would say, against um, totalitarianism or autocracy. Uh, look at that. Attention au début, Hitler faisait rire. Be careful. At the beginning, Hitler was kind of funny. In a way, he made you laugh because you thought he was a joke. You thought it couldn't be serious. You thought that it was just uh, some kind of uh, lunatic who would just uh, disappear from the political scene. So here, by making ridiculously ridiculing Hitler, um, what he's doing is warning us against the threat of people who might look like they're puppets or they're they are um, just too 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 ridiculous to be true and end up uh, being the leader of a country. So once again, the poster here is um, um, bearing the marks, the token of a handmade poster or handmade tract as if it were a political tract that you would um, hand out in the streets and during um, a demonstration or maybe something that you would um, 
put on a bulletin board um, or on, in the street for political campaigns. So there is this kind of graphic political, uh, almost um, anti-system um, type of feel. Uh, in the next one, I'm gonna show you by the same artist, Alain Le Carnac. I wanna go back first to Andrea Montaigne, the Renaissance artist who was born in, uh, in the 1400s. And uh, he died actually, I think in Mantua. And this artist um, was an Italian engraver and he was a painter. And I, I'm looking at the picture right now and I see that it's definitely first Renaissance. Huh? He really definitely broke away with the Gothic style uh, and um, he did so uh, throughout his life. So he was marked by the Greco-Roman heritage, as you could see with the exploiting of the perspective uh, by his research on the shortcut and the, the limbs that appear close to us uh, or far from us don't have the same weight within the picture. And he was able to really work on that. He also innovated in the, the matter of um, architecture with wall, decorations, pillars, columns. Here we have a beautiful Corinthian uh, column. And he, he really created works of uh, virtu virtuosity, great virtuosity, uh, and had a lot of trompe l'oeil um, and, and a keen sense of detail. If you could see in the background, everything is really pre precise. So look what Le Carnac did. Um, uh, he really worked on using the, the uh, Renaissance artist uh, imagery, but of course, um, killing it, uh, killing San Sebastian here with another type of uh, danger. Um, so I really like the idea that it mixes two things, la pub tu, advertising kills, which is literally shooting himself in the foot since he's a graphic artist specializing in advertising, but also it's a campaign against uh, smoking with all the cigarettes uh, that works uh, as arrows uh, piercing uh, Saint Sebastian from all around. Um, I really like this. Uh, graphically, it's um, provocative. Uh, the red, of course, shows us the danger with the little dripping on the on the end, which refers to blood and suffering. Uh, and pretty much the rest of the image is the same, is identical to the original, which once again brings us back to um, advertising becoming uh, the new form of art, uh, boring from high art. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, Le Carnac wanted to be considered as an artist. Finally, I would show you that wonderful um, work that you did in font, um, you're all familiar with uh, France's motto, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. Here, there's a twist, Liberté, Égalité, blue and red. And in white, not fraternity, but laïcité, which as you know, is uh, uh, roughly speaking, the um, equivalent, the counterpart of secularism. Uh, a secular society is important for us where you don't show the marks of religion on yourself in the public sphere, or at least if you work for the public governments, the government needs to be free of any association re with religion. And the idea that uh, there is a separation of uh, between power and religion. Um, and this embedded it at the time that um, was very important because in order to find um, solidarity and a sense of group, the sense of the group in France during this uh, huge waves of immigration was to all feel the same, to all feel that we could share the same values. And uh, laïcité is a way to um, understand that you are free to uh, have your own faith and your own rituals, but in order to preserve the common unity, you don't need to use that religion to separate yourself from the rest, from the unity. This is completely different. And this is an aside from 
American communitarism, but once again, France has 65 million uh, inhabitants while the States ha has 380. So it's important to, to keep a unity um, in France much more than, um, than it is to uh, encourage a community together, such as in the States. I hope I make myself very clear. We'll, we'll be able, we could talk about um, laicity for hours, but because it's also seen um, from foreign countries as, um, as some kind of censorship for people who don't really understand laicity. Uh, it's often seen as something that bars for people, specifically immigrants or people with another religion than Catholicism or Christ or other than Christians, let's say, um, from that prevents them from uh, conducting their rituals. But that's not true. The, the idea is there's got to be some for, some sort of a unity in the nation, and then in the private sphere. Everyone is welcome and has the right to practice their religion. So he really made a point here in embedding uh, the laicite within the liberty and equality. I think it's really well done. Claude uh, Bayarjon is uh, another self-taught. He was self-taught French poster artist who was born in 1949. And for most of his childhood, he lived in the middle of the forest with his grandmother. And um, so nature became part of his world and a folk arts traditions also um, perspiring through his work and had a powerful inspiration throughout his life. He arrived in Paris in the uh, late sixties, right after the, the riots. And he met uh, other artists and realized um, a set of a, uh, kinetic works uh, uh, where, you know, the movement was quite interesting. He also uh, discovered photo montages uh, and was very keen on fusing different kinds of movements such as Dada uh, or uh, surrealism uh, in his posters. During the 80s, he actually worked uh, with Hector Catolica, I don't know if you're familiar with them, and became acquainted with the works of Roman Shislevsics, who became his friends. And together, they actually, their affinities led him to, um, to consider the political function again of uh, the image and the poster in particular. And uh, he really considered the poster as one of uh, the media of expression most suitable for the need or even um, the urgency to express oneself. So it gradually, uh, Bayarjon did refine his style and technique with photomontage in black and white or sepia, as we can see in, in, a, in a second. And he developed his shots, uh, which he cut and assembled in compositions mixing, I would say, realism and, and utopism. Uh, um, here's one beautiful image. Uh, so as I said, they were mostly in black and white, but on this one, it's a sepia image, in this case, vintage sepia. Uh, and his images often bear witness uh, with a black humor of um, some sort of disillusioned era uh, when the dreams of a better world were crushed under either concrete, under cars, under pollution, under greed. And this is what we see here. Um, it's so beautifully done. Uh, the, the bars of this prison are actually coins, uh, and all coins that I recognize, those were francs, and there were 10 franc coins. Um, and the grip that this guy has on those bars uh, is really emblematic of uh, the emerging capitalism that we're going to see in Europe and the search for money, for more uh, greed. Um, he used to believe, I uh, quote him, the earth is a paradise that has been turned into hell, end of quote. This is a great representation of that. In this, time, in this um, poster, souffrir au travail n'est pas une fatalité. Suffering at work is not... Uh, you know, is not, a, is, how could I translate that? 
uh, effectively. Um, you, you don't have to suffer at work. Uh, it's not a fatality. It's not, you're not doomed to suffer at work. Uh, it's the institutions, it's the, the format uh, that has been imposed on workers that kills them. So this could be changed. Here, time is money is really well done by, uh, you know, the hands of the clock. Uh, and the guy seems to be uh, completely harassed by time and the pressure to uh, produce and productivity. Um, not sure it's because of the clock or it's because of the look and the sepia, vintage sepia um, hue, but I cannot help but think of Modern Times here by Charlie Chaplin. There is some kind of sense of a disillusionment and utter fatigue, uh, almost as if you were part of a system that was crushing you. And as you could see, the clock is disproportionately big uh, compared to the guy. The guy's face is not to be seen, once again, highlighting the dehumanizing um, quality of work or at least uh, working methods and the idea that we have a circle uh, with a clock with the lettering if time is money might be i would say might be it's once again a semiotic analysis an indication that it's going in circles and that uh, there is no end to this finally uh, this is a picture of the an imagined ring boulevard around the city of Paris. Those of you who have been stuck in traffic in the uh, peripheric in the ring boulevard around Paris and its suburbs uh, know how uh, devilish and how uh, mind blowing it can be uh, an experience and it's never ending lines of cars congested at all hours, not even only at rush hours, but with this that ebb and flow of cars going in and out of the city uh, is really, uh, I would say, a, a, a real a representation of hell. And this is well um, graphically represented here. You could feel the desperate um, rendition of daily routines here. Um, um, I would say that if you're all familiar with this, um, with this uh, saying, Metro, Boulot dodo, you know, which is the idea that you work for nothing in the end. You take the metro, you go to work, boulot, and then you sleep, dodo, and then the next day you 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 start you start all over again, uh, as if you were an automat, uh, in a some kind of a robotic way. Well, this is well represented. What accentuates the idea that there is no no end, there is no way out, is that actually, as you could see. Um, <clears throat> the line of flight here is closed by another wall, so they're really going nowhere. The fact that um, the sky is threatening with all those stormy clouds, the fact that you don't see anything but cars, and that the cars have the back to us, which doesn't uh, augur well for the future. <clears throat> really like this. Let me get a little bit of water. To continue, <clears throat> and we're going to continue with uh, two more by Michel Le Carnec. I thought that this one was wonderful. Um, the constancy, the constancy, excuse me, of his commitment and the strength of his composition is to be seen here. Um, he really, Le Carnec really signed masterpieces, uh, and this poster was used for an exhibition on the propaganda of the Vichy regime, where here you could see Marshal Pétain invites himself into a family and literally takes all the heads of the family. You remember talking about another threefold slogan that went around uh, during the Vichy regime, uh, travail, famille, patrie, right? That Vichy encouraged uh, work, family, uh, and uh, nation. Those were the three key words uh, to be a good citizen at the time. 
uh, encouraging the birth rate, of course, because family had to be uh, at the center of your preoccupations. Um, and this is such a wink at that it's it's still making fun of uh, Petain's uh, threefold um, slogan. I think it's really well done. Like those old daguerreotype uh, photographs for which you had to stand three to four hours <laughs> at the beginning of a of photography. Uh, it really speaks of an old regime, something that's um, backward in all sense of the term. And I thought that was a great uh, propaganda against the propaganda under Vichy. Really well done. And finally, uh, those three images that really were not posters for any products or for any exhibit. They were just posters that were disseminated throughout town uh, in cultural spaces that were advertising uh, his work, Bayajon work as a graphist. Um, I'm sorry, I said Le Carnac before. I meant uh, um, Bayajon. Um, and um, it's interesting here, you could see that there is something of a Magritte here in his work. Uh, the image is a meeting that questions and disturbs. This is how he sees his work. And I would say that um, those three images really are emblematic of this uh, you know, mindset. Um, contrary to popular belief, uh, Bayarjon said, we do not live in a world of images, but of stereotypes imposed by the dictatorship of money. The stereotype is the opposite of an image. The image is an encounter that questions and disturbs. And Bayarjon, I believe, always disturbed. Um, I really, really like uh, this idea that you need to go beyond what is expected of you in the image. You, um, um, references should be, uh, should go beyond, uh, what is expected, what is known, and you should be provocative. You should bring, uh, people to further think about the world, about an issue, about a product, about a service. And I believe this is what he did here beautifully. Bouvet is also someone that you really need to know if you talk about the 80s, 90s. Michel Bouvet is one of the most famous poster designers, uh, and both in France and also uh, abroad. He's a great humanist. He actually uh, graduated from the National uh, School of Fine Arts in the late 70s, and he went on uh, creating uh, posters for streets, cultural, and uh, I would say knowledgeable audiences, there are a lot of references. The theater, the opera, uh, or cultural center posters that he created um, obliged in a way its author to a, a lively dialogue with the sponsor or with the artist. You know, this is not someone who um, just wants to impose his style when he creates a poster, let's say for Hamlet, you know, or for the Théâtre de la Madeleine or uh, Le Châtelet, he really gets into, he dives into the history of the place. If he uh, creates a poster for a theater, he uh, dives into the work, if it's a poster for a specific play. And he really then um, swallows it, uh, remasticates it, and spit it out, I would say, in his own way. I really like the way he dissect Shakespeare or um, Genet or Chekhov uh, in order to approach them with the respect, uh, with respect. Uh, for him, it's a necessity. Uh, and he's very conscientious as, as a graphic artist. He really wants to honor the work, which is not always the case as you can see. Uh, if you remember last, last week, um, Good is someone who I would say put his style, his aesthetic, I would say a little bit before even um, the product, the topic or the event he, he needed to cover to illustrate. But Michel Bouvet's poster 
by the force of his own language, conveys a valuable information about the topic uh, for which he creates. Um, it captures our gaze, it forces us in a way to understand um, things that were hidden in the, in the work. Uh, and he also questions us on the representations, um, on the graphic or photographic uh, compositions that we are familiar with. Um, uh, sometimes he would create even objects or lettering, new lettering. For example, he did a poster on Hamlet for which he created a gigantic H shaped in metal in three dimensions that he photographed and then used in the poster. So um, his use of color is usually flat, um, often primary, and it's, it's isolated, uh, contained by the black line. And this is uh, evident in the poster that I'm, I'm going to show you here. You see for the Opera de Massy, Madame Butterfly. So here there is a, a, a dark line uh, which contains the coloring and uh, with slight shading. Uh, here it really works with Puccini's work. Uh, there is some kind of Asian feel to this, not only because of um, the sun and the pagodas, but also because of the line, the idea that uh, as Japanese work ink, uh, with black lettering or sc scroll rolls, and you could feel that here. So you remember on a trip to Nagasaki, uh, Pinkerton makes light of a marriage contract with a young geisha, Cho Cho Chan, who is Madame Butterfly. And when he returns to America, you remember the young wife patiently waits for the return of her beloved of whom she had a son. This is the story of Madame Butterfly, if you remember. And you can get that feel of waiting with the shores and the sun. Uh, with, I, I appreciate him not having any uh, protagonist here. It's, it, 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 it puts the weight on uh, the country, the shores, the weight. And I like this contained line. The contained line, so you could see, for example, I just, I want to show you a former poster of the 1930s, uh, completely different by Leon Decker, which, who is my absolute uh, favorite uh, American uh, illustrator. Uh, um, Leon Decker, if you're familiar with him, he did a lot of the um, uh, graphic work for Arrows, the shirts, or for Saturday Evening Post, and um, his babies, his children, is women or even guys uh, have a specific profile. They're, they're very detailed. And you could see that this is completely different. This is a totally different treatment from this for the same opera, really focusing on the persons and the people. So you could see, depending on the era, the decade and the artist, you could have a total different feel uh, for, the, for the same story, as a matter of fact. But let's go back to the contained line I was talking about. You are familiar, I'm sure, with the all photography festival that happens to take place every year in July and a little bit of August. This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, festival to attend. All places in the city in Arles are actually uh, showing work of photographers. And I remember uh, um, what happened with uh, in 2001 because of 9-11. Uh, 2002 was uh, actually a tribute um, to 9-11 um, and uh, all the shows that were um, shown, all the exhibits that were shown in our, at the time of the photography festival were actually about um, by American photographers and a lot of them covered the tragedy. So I always attend this festival and it has this attention grabbing uh, line of posters, uh, thanks to um, Bouvet. Uh, Bouvet does this once again, very flat colors, contained in line. It's very simple, it's almost childlike, but it does the trick and it really pulls you because every year for many, many years, he chose an animal to, for the festival. And, and so you were kind of connecting to the animal. You know, you could see it on logos, on mugs, on you usually have a tote bag 
when you attend the festival. So all throughout town, you, you have a rhino or sometimes it's a giraffe or a deer or an eggplant, why not? Uh, <laughs> or a goat. It's quite interesting because it's, it forces you to, um, you know, go beyond your comfort zone and not specifically associate photography with a photography poster, which is also quite interesting to use a graphic art, which is not photography, to advertise photography. I strongly recommend attending this show, um, using the opportunity to let you know about this festival. And it's great because at the same time, ha the um, theater festival in Avignon happens and the uh, lyrical festival in Aix happens, everything around the same area in Provence. Finally, I would like to talk about Philippe Apelowig. Um, and Philippe Apelowig really um, is a, a wonderful guy who really worked on lettering. So I'm gonna pass quickly on his work, but I just wanna make sure that you understand that his specialty was working on the lettering and the color. And he was responsible for um, the cover of uh, the exhibit uh, uh, that took place in 2010 at Le Grand Palais on Yves Saint Laurent. And uh, you, could, you could see that he played with the Cassandre uh, logo and uh, made it a little more uh, patriotic with this uh, blue, white, and red. He also so also created um, a poster for Le Havre with the same kind of stencil almost look mixed with uh, uh, a font that to me reminds me of um, Wheel of Fortune letter. I don't know if you have the same feeling, but I, ever since I saw that poster, I thought about that. And I was just wondering where Vanna was. Um, Look at this one, wonderful, wonderful. So I let, let you look at this for a second. And I'm sure you recognize that this is a poster for a musical, an American in Paris. What better idea than encrypting within the symbol of Paris, uh, the three colors, white, blue, and red, that symbolize not only France, but America. I absolutely adore this poster. I think it's a dancing Eiffel Tower. It's uh, both a fusion of our two countries and, um, and it's really well done. And it's a, a different way to, to, to sell the show. Uh, you don't need to show dancers anymore. Everyone knows the show. So the idea that you embed an American within uh, the most emblematic symbol of Paris is a great fusion of the two, and it really is emblematic of the story. Um, this was at Le Châtelet, Théâtre du Châtelet, which often uh, shows uh, musicals, because you have to find to see musicals in Paris, uh, I mean, musicals, uh, classic musicals, and uh, this is a place where you could see. I remember seeing uh, My Fair Lady there too. Finally, um, I want to introduce you to this last work, by Ape Loig, which once again is a wonderful work. I'll let you uh, read it. Have you found what it is? It's a play by UNESCO, La Cantatrice Chauve, the bold soprano. You remember this kind of a completely crazy surrealistic a piece of uh, theater by UNESCO, an absolute delight to, to watch. Uh, it's a British couple and there's absolutely no, no connection with what's happening. It's, it's completely crazy, uh, grotesque, fun. Uh, you know, it's what we call the theater of the absurd. It's absurd theater. Uh, by UNESCO, and uh, the same thing that Beckett would do, would do uh, Waiting for Godot. And this, this kind of uh, lettering that takes a little bit of time um, to decipher is really in keeping with the, the piece itself. It's going in all directions. It doesn't seem to have a, co um, 
um, it doesn't seem to have any direction. And this is what you get from this lettering. Some are small, some are big. So UNESCO, La Cantatrice, Chauve. Um, I really like this. It's fun. It's playful as the players. And it also is absurd. The black and white stands out with the logo of the theater here in red. Uh, this is always uh, uh, a wonderful way to um, combine colors. In this section, I would like to talk to you about what I did with my own posters. Um, you remember when I um, when I came to New Orleans, the second year I created a theater festival, which was called Actitude, and I staged Cyrano de Bergerac in English, in actually on Carondelet in the old uh, Masonic temple that uh, at the time belonged to UNO. And I reprised my work at Ascension Community Theater in Gonzales and uh, a few years later, and I did another Cyrano. And I would like you to, to see what, uh, how I worked once again with the fusion of uh, French and American culture. Um, for me, it was very important to be true to the work, I uh, used the whole script, so it had to be traditional. So I used that um, drawing of, um, that actually was done uh, by Edmond Rostand himself, the playwright of Cyrano, you could see. And from afar, if you agree with me, Cyrano with his um, sword really looks like a rooster. And it's important because you know that the rooster is uh, or the cock is really the um, the emblem of France. So I really wanted to signify this very quickly. Then I chose the colors. What color could I choose? Blue, white, and red. Because if I was staging the play in America and it was an emblematic play of, Fr of French culture, probably one of the, the biggest character of uh, French culture and French theater. And finally, I wanted to pay a tribute to America. So I used um, this kind of um, kaleidoscopic uh, Andy Warhol-like uh, use a treatment of um, the colors and very much uh, in the same vein as what he did with the poppies, or with the Campbell Soup, or with the Marilyn Monroe's uh, series, I pay tribute to America. So I, I think I was really happy with the design. At the end, um, I put a background of this old parchment paper because you remember that uh, Cyrano's story is all about him uh, helping Christian, a guy who is a soldier who really cannot write, write uh, love letters to Roxanne uh, on the behalf of Christian. And only at the very end of the show will you know that actually uh, Cyrano was the writer and that actually Roxanne never really fell in love with the letters written by Christian, but fell in love with the letters written by Cyrano. And he will only tell her and confess that to her as he's dying. It's a beautiful show. I hope you like this poster. I do, and I mostly like the cast who was in it. Uh, another poster that I created was Resilience. Um, this was a show in Baton Rouge that I did. Um, it was a fundraising for our, our center. And um, the idea was uh, a reading of letters of army veterans, uh, US veterans who went to France and who sent letters to their significant other, to their family, sisters, mothers. And we read those letters. Uh, it was just beautiful. And it was a testimony of resilience and courage. So here again, uh, I used this old world vintage parchment paper to give an old, you know, uh, I would say vintage look uh, and almost um, wrinkled as if you had a letter, you know, those letters you keep and they're all wrinkled and the envelope gets yellow with, uh, with time. Um, I wanted resilience to be in red, of course, but I wanted also to refer to the idea of lettering 
postcards, things you send when you're abroad as, as those uh, veteran um, soldiers did. And here you get this uh, little you know, carousel of postcards that you find in Paris along the River Seine uh, with those watercolors that you can buy, old framed ads posters such as the Camel cigarette posters, and of course, a wink at America with Marilyn, Marilyn who went, who, who visited the troops and sang for them. So I thought it was a, a, a nice vintage uh, tribute to America. Finally, those of you who have attended this, maybe, Cocomania, there was a tribute um, that I created with my uh, class, uh, tribute uh, to Chanel. So um, we featured in this fashion show, it was a fashion show that was held at the uh, Museum of Art in Baton Rouge absolutely gorgeous with the reflecting pool. We chose it facing uh, the um, capital, which looked like a red lipstick. Um, and we wanted to feature those emerging designers, uh, Christopher Nelson, Nathalie Broussa, Queen Connors, Sarah Friday, Tina Nguyen, uh, Queen Connors who now works for Vogue Australia. Um, so she really continued uh, with uh, fashion. And so they are all, all designed uh, five um, capsule collection, a five-piece collection, capsule collection, uh, and they uh, drew their inspiration from Chanel. So it was a wonderful show, and we wanted to get that feel of uh, handmade, uh, tailor-made work. So Coco Mania was this font uh, referring to the beautiful ink or uh, red markers that Chanel was using when drawing. We paid a tribute to her uh, fragrance, Chanel Number no. 5. We used the flesh color. That was one of the four colors she used with white, black, beige. Uh, and um, we, um, we did it in a way that uh, was light, almost like bubbles of champagnes in order to, uh, uh, you know, mimic uh, the, the style that she was so fond of, uh, a, a minimalist uh, style. Uh, for her, less was more. And I think you, you get that in the blanks that are still on the poster. I really like that the poster. This is a show I did for my friend who, who now um, works um, in Penn State. Uh, she's at Penn State University. Um, she's a Martinique-born uh, writer. She specializes in, uh, I would say, images of masculinity and images of domination. And her work also centers around slaves, slavery, neocolonialism. So we became friends because of the field of my study, which is post-colonialism. And uh, Fabienne Canor is her name. Fabienne Canor's work, Humus, uh, was um, a tribute to women who had uh, slaves who had from Martinique who had jumped out of a, off a boat and had swum uh, and saved their lives from slavery and uh, I think landed in on the shores of Brittany and Humus is really talking about slavery and here we wanted to see the dichotomy of what it is to be a slave to be a slave in a world of supposed freedom um, is mind boggling. So we uh, really cut that image into two sections, half of the face because the slave is dehumanized and really is not a fully bodied uh, member of society uh, against its will, of course, but that's the way it is. And the darkness on the other side, humus in red refers to the blood, of course, it was uh, performed at Café Istanbul in 2015. Oh, we had to add a catchphrase, the story of 14 women in the hold of a slave ship because it was a show, because there is a reason uh, we have to have a, some sort of synopsis to attract uh, the, uh, the audience. So you see the uh, constraints of a poster for a show it, it, are completely different from the constraints you would find to sell a product or an idea. You have to have the information of where it happens, uh, some information about the cast, uh, often the price, 
the time, but it has to convey um, the meaning, the, the essence of the show. It has to be a microcosm of what the show, the book is about, the play. And I hope that you enjoyed my sharing those with you. Finally, I want to talk about briefly the images of women. Uh, women uh, in the 90s with the emergence of uh, the top model uh, was often the victim of the objectiviz ob objectivization and um, almost like fetishization of the female body. You see that in a lot of commercials, but even as early as the 90s, while Me Too movement has not, had not even uh, come to existence yet, you could find people who are already debunking some of those myths while using it, using them at the same time. So there is some kind of fusion between, I would say, machist behavior uh, or machist imagery and truly um, feminist work. So <clears throat> here is one image that I find really uh, disturbing. Um, first, the sexualization of animals is something that is never almost being seen. So um, usually you use animals to talk to kids for fairy tale stories, for um, morality stories. So the idea, and this is monsters, for example, always talk to, um, are used for uh, advertising for kids because monsters are desexualized. They don't have any sexuality, so they can be easily used for kids. Well, in this commercial by, uh, for Orangina, they went the other way around and they had some kind of uh, um, South American feel to it where they all uh, dance merengue and samba um, in the Amazonian. Uh, I don't know for what reason, probably because of citrus fruit, but this is quite a stretch. And then you have a deer and you have an octopus and you have all kinds of giraffes, even uh, a rhino, an elephant. I mean, all kinds of animals who get, you know, who get on the dance floor and strut their stuff. It's quite disturbing, but um, it was an interesting way to get away from the uh, use of women and, uh, you know, barely clad women and substitute them with animals. I thought it was uh, worth noticing at the time. You could see naturally juicy bubbles, bubbles shake, um, the slightly erotic uh, use of, uh, of the bottle uh, while um, the ref reference to um, flash dance, uh, you remember the scene? with the shower uh, is quite disturbing to say the least, but at the same time gets the feeling of child, I mean, childlike uh, imagery because you're using animals, the colors are bright. So the messages are really completely uh, mixed here. And let me tell you a quick story. I remember being on, uh, coming back over the summer to Marseille and uh, seeing those, you know, the trucks that do the the promotion uh and they had a big bottle of orangina on the top of the roof of, of the car and i remember they were serving uh, drinks um uh and it was hilarious what happened was hilarious i saw i saw them approaching families on the beach with little trays of of, of the drinks in little paper cups so people could taste that naturally juicy drink so um but they didn't and, with an apron or you know a cafe, a waiter looking. No, no, no. They did it in the costumes. So you would have this uh, almost barely clad, half naked giraffe approaching families with kids and give uh, presenting to them a tray of drinks, which was completely um, out of this world. And I remember coming back from the states, you know, <laughs> freshly out from the plane and seeing these type of things, I was not used to my country anymore, uh, or at least to France since I have two countries now. So it was hilarious. And I remember this interaction with a lady. So um, the um, giraffe 
uh, it was the giraffe. The giraffe comes to the lady and her son and uh, ask them if they want to taste this. And um, the little boy, looking a little bit terrified by these giraffes, gets the drink and starts drinking. And here you are, you know, I mean, you're in France, you're in my hometown. There's a naked giraffe, a mother, a child. And guess what the mother says? The mother tap the little boy hands and scolds him and says, what? And the little boy looks at her and say, can you tell, can you say thank you? <laughs> this is, so that to me was very funny. I mean, the only thing that the mother had to say was, you need to say thank you to the naked giraffes. That's very important. So <laughs> this is friends. I really thought it was hilarious. This is also a pun. It's very witty. It's, um, you know, trying to get the wife out of the sphere of the kitchen. So you have Babette, j'en fais ce que je veux. Babette is the name of a woman, usually. But here, Babette is the name of a cream, heavy cream. Um, so the idea here is I do anything I want with Babette. So you could see how this is working on a double entendre, uh, that she has weapons that are all the utensils around her. Uh, the image almost looks um, like a, you know, vis a -vis, um, you know, the Da Vinci's um, imagery of manhood. Uh, so you have this idea, Vitruvio, you know, image of um, power, uh, but surrounded with the utensil that you usually use in the kitchen, the apron, everything is a uh, reading woman, but at the same time, she takes the first she takes center stage, she's in control, and she does what she wants. And she does what she wants even with the own idea that you cannot do what you want with women. The idea is you are a woman and you are in charge of what is being done to you or with you. This is really funny. On the surface of things, it looks once again um, quite... Um, Machist, but it is the reverse. It doesn't read quickly as such, but this is my interpretation. Along the same lines of the, the, the excuse me, the slides that I just showed, um, this commercial, this is actually a campaign. This was commissioned by the French government. Uh, the health services, to be precise, and um, it was uh, actually shown um, at school. It was to be seen in a bus or metro stations. It was uh, posted all around the cities throughout France and its overseas department. And as you can see, it is quite provocative because we are in the uh, mid 90s, the AIDS epidemic is at its crisis. A lot of people are dying. A lot of people are contaminated, and um, the an, um, an elderly lady um, is not the first person you think of when you want to talk about sex or if you want to talk about STDs. So the choice that the government made here is. Uh, uh, full of innuendos. So let's look at the poster and we'll try to decipher what is really being said here. So we have a wonderful uh, portrait. Uh, uh, the expression of the lady is uh, to be determined. I mean, is she happy? Is she surprised? Is it one of those candid shots uh, that uh, is taken? No matter what, her name is Odette as uh, the pink lettering underneath the catchphrase uh, mentions. Um, you could see that the pink is a reference three times in the O of capote. Capote is the slang for condom. Uh, so this is a, a pink preservative uh, condom here on top. Then you have Odette. 
and then you have her lipstick or her cheekbones. Um, the idea also is that this lady has had quite um, a happy sexual life since she's been using 13,874 condoms in her life. So the idea that they would resort to um, a kind of a um, ranking, uh, uh, in a way, of our, uh, sexual performances is quite provocative. But beyond this message is a fun message to connect uh, not sex with death, but sex with uh, fun. You remember this campaign is aimed at uh, the youth, so it's quite interesting. The youth also is probably um, more likely to respond to the fact that we are not trying to replicate the youth. Uh, usually those campaigns, those health campaigns uh, fail to replicate how the youth is um, portrayed or behaves and youth usually despises uh, the, these type of uh, commercials or campaigns. So it's much uh, wittier to resort to someone who could be their grandmother for whom they have a respect, um, for whom uh, they have admiration and from whom they can learn. So I believe um, once again, using uh, tradition and uh, putting it upside down and working for the new generation really works. Uh, and I think the last thing that is embedded in this campaign and really works is the idea that, uh, again, of empowering women. Um, the idea that this woman has been independent, has had a happy sexual life, that she's done whatever she wanted, that we are not here to judge is very important. And I think this is a good message for the youth. Of course, um, not, uh, everyone would agree, but in the scope of what France is all about, in the way people are being brought, with the, um, with the um, freedom that we have with sexual matters, you remember the uh, anecdotes that I was uh, uh, sharing with you about the Orangina um, uh, beach tasting, this is uh, how you could say that it works. The next one is just provocative. It's by Reporters Sans Frontières, which is to uh, journalism what uh, Doctors Without Borders is to uh, humanitarian help or to medicine. This is an organization that, help, uh, that helps um, freedom of the press. And here, Marianne is tarnished by blood. So you could see in this uh, ocean of white shading, uh, you have only one uh, significant color, the color of violence, uh, which is um, showing that Marianne has been hit. And she's been hit really hard by the absence of censorship that France uh, has been known for. If you could read the little text underneath the catchphrase, uh, France is ranked 35th uh, out of 168 countries in terms of freedom of the press. So for a country that uh, prides itself to be the country of debate, of discussion, um, of, of light, what I mean by light is uh, enlightenment, uh, this is far from being a good result. Um, of course, um, Reporters Sans Frontières here uh, drives the nails in further by uh, resorting to um, an anti-woman trope in its catchphrase. Franchement, elle l'a cherché. Frankly, she deserved it. The same type of things you would hear after uh, some of a woman's rape uh, and comments, disparaging comments about her outfit. You know, um, some people might think that um, uh, being dressed a certain way, being too provocative, uh, as somehow. Um, allowed someone to abuse uh, or to be um, teased by uh, an outfit or a, a makeup or a way to be, while we should not question uh, what a woman's wear, we should question and uh, punish the person who is uh, violent, either in terms of words or actions against this woman. A woman dresses the way she wants. 
a woman behaves the way she wants. Uh, the blame should be on the one who is uh, transgressing uh, the order and uh, resorting to violence to show his, his or her discontent. So it's interesting here that uh, reporters without borders is putting on the same uh, uh, on the same level uh, the censorship they are being the victims of uh, on the one hand and on the other hand um, the um, uh, I mean the um, anti-feminist um, comments and urban legends that women uh, who are uh, the victims of rape or uh, being the victims of. So it's interesting how this works. So what apparently uh, is a anti-censorship type of poster goes beyond in, and also has ramifications with the fight that women lead uh, against abuse, feminicides and uh, discrimination. We are now going to move on to uh, uh, my last slide. Just as provocative, this um, slide, this visual by Eram, Eram is a shoe company, uh, does a lot of things in one. Um, first, let's talk about the image. The image is provocative, there is some kind some kind of nakedness here, not fully naked. I mean, at least we don't see the genitals, but it is naked, but it of course is referencing uh, Yves Saint Laurent when he posed uh, for Jean Lucier for his perfume uh, pour homme. So there is a cultural component. Uh, the idea is uh, Alexandre Mathieu, the model here has been, uh, has taken the place of a lady. And why is it so? Well, then the catchphrase, the second component of the visual, explains why. Aucun corps de femme n'a été exploité dans cette publicité. No female body has been exploited in this ad. We are now here referencing uh, the fact that women have always been the objects uh, and not the subjects of the male gaze in art, in art history. We have plethora of uh, um, uh, male painters, but uh, we will really, um, you know, uh, struggle to find names of uh, female painters. I can only name a few from the top of my head, Berthe Morisot and Marie Cassatt, for example, in the 19th century, Marie Cassatt being American from Philadelphia, so not even French. So in terms of trying to find uh, women who had uh, access to art as artists, it, it's, it's very hard. So here, uh, once again, we are turning uh, upside down such cliches. We're debunking the myth and we're trying not to use women as attention grabbers, but as, uh, and we're using men in order to do so. So we, I'd like to remind you that this is uh, the beginning of the 90s. So the idea that the feminist uh, fight uh, even though it started in the uh, with Simone de Beauvoir, uh, it's still, and we've had um, the right for abortion in the late 70s, uh, thanks to Simone Veil, we have um, slow progress in France. And for example, parity, which is the law that uh, forces governments, institutions, locals and authorities, uh, city councils uh, to have at least 25% of the staff um, females uh, uh, is only going to be in existence in uh, the late 90s. So we have a long way to go, as the ads for Virginia Slim's uh, cigarettes uh, would say. Uh, here, um, it's easy, but instead of a woman who will place a man, uh, why not? At least it works and it strikes home because once again, you will remember these ads because not only is the guy naked, not only is he seated in a kind of feminine way, but he also is wearing high heels. The very shoes that are being uh, sold here for 399 francs. Uh, it's really punny. It's, uh, it shows Aram uh, 
comes out of this ad and this campaign uh, as a uh, pro-woman um, trying to debunk uh, urban legends and myths and stereotypes and also very creative in terms of the campaign. And, and I think this is someone, since I just mentioned Simone de Beauvoir, um, the author of The Second Sex, would have been quite uh, in agreement with. Finally, it is time for me to show you um, the cherry on the cake, which is a commercial. I have focused throughout those three talks mainly on visuals, but it's time for me um, to um, share with you um, a commercial, truly, and not a visual. So we are going to uh, do a semiotic analysis that I'm going to apply uh, to uh, moving images and not so much uh, static images. So what I'm gonna ask Bob is to play the commercial on the next slide. Before uh, we do so, I'd like to tell you that it is a commercial for um, Dior uh, fragrance called J'adore. Uh, it's, it features Charlize Theron, um, the uh, South African uh, artist, actress, model, uh, who is also uh, living in part of her time in uh, Hollywood in California. So we'll talk about all the symbols. Uh, I would like you to watch this commercial, uh, thinking of luxury, all the components that evoke luxury. And the second uh, component I'd like you to focus on is empowering women. It's about uh, one minute and 30 seconds. Slide, please. Um, Bob, you can play uh, the commercial. I think the commercial just finished, I hope, because as you were playing it, Finally, slide, please. Um, Bob, you can play uh, the commercial. Well, I think the commercial.
Well, I think the commercial just finished, I hope, because as you were playing it, I couldn't see it myself in the, on the um, presenter's view. So I hope it worked. If it didn't, you realize that we are in Versailles, uh, that the runway show that Charlie Theron character is going to be part of is actually taking place in the Hall of Mirrors. Immediately, we are uh, connecting the Dior brand with luxury. Um, you know that very few movies or very few ads have been shot in uh, either the Louvre or um, Versailles. Uh, Versailles had maybe a maximum of seven movies shot uh, on its premises, so it is already very prestigious. You notice that uh, Charlize Theron's character is late. She's a VIP. She can uh, really um, be late because she is a celebrity. And they, this kind of um, la last minute rush that she's embarking us, the viewers, uh, onto is um, very interesting because it speaks of a very busy life, the, the life of the VIPs, the life of the elite, and it really feeds the trope of luxury. So does the staircase at the beginning. You remember, after the um, panoramic on the gates of Versailles, um, we have this cam the camera going up the staircase and following her rushing towards um, backstage. Once again, staircase means elevation. Elevation means we are above. A luxury brand is above any other type of brand. So anytime you see staircase, um, the semiotic analysis, analysis, not the Freudian analysis, um, would mean that there is some sort of uh, progression elevation. I would like to also to, to mention that immediately from the get-go, we are connecting to the power of women. Why? Well, you remember the gates of Versailles. You remember that's where the women came. All the women of Paris w really walked all night, uh, the 40 uh, kilometers that separate the center of Paris to Versailles. And they walked in order to show their discontent for having no bread, no flour for their kids, they were starving. And you remember that's when uh, the poor Marie Antoinette has been accused of saying those eponymous, uh, let them eat cake, which she never said, as you know, and if you attended one of my presentation on Marie Antoinette, you know that's her cousin who said that and was not even talking within the context of the riot. Those gates then are connected to female, power. This is where the women uh, rioted uh, prior to the revolution. So this is important that immediately luxury is connected to the past as well. It's very brilliant. It's also very daring for luxury brand to incorporate somehow um, the uh, actors of the revolution, the very actors who would uh, be had the ones who had prestige and privileges. Another component of the power woman is, of course, the uh, soundtrack. You could hear Gossip, which is an American band. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're originally from Arkansas. And uh, um, the lyrics really put the stress on the fact that uh, if you want something in life, you really have to, uh, you know, uh, root work for it hard, uh, which is exactly, it has also the feel of a, a Dolly Parton song, if you agree with me, and the idea that you, you need to work, you need to be independent and resourceful and resilient. And this is what we see throughout. In order also to connect women to power, we have um, some sort of a um, pantheon of Hollywood stars and celebrities who all had powers. You recognize Grace Kelly uh, at the beginning. At one point, there is Marlene Dietrich. Uh, we have Sophia Loren. And of course, we have uh, Marilyn Monroe holding the fragrance bottle. Um, it's very interesting that a jaw here connects uh, its uh, fragrance to those Hollywood stars 
it's not only once again to talk about VIP and elitism, it's also to connect and to, I would say, um, root uh, the brand deep into tradition. Throughout the decades, Jor uh, uh, has been the fragrance of powerful women. Finally, and this is the part of the commercial that a luxury brand cannot do without. That's why they always criticize, because despite the fact, and it is the same with Chanel, despite the fact that they're rooting for a powerful women, they always have to end up uh, showing us a glamorous woman walking. Here, they do a good job at not showing too much of the body. You could see that she's undressing and dressing with a back to us. Um, which is quite interesting because it helps them show both power and beauty without falling into the trap of objectifying uh, the character that Charlize Theron is playing. Uh, and they do show the body, but it's quite delicately. It's with um, some kind of transparency uh, that is in keeping with the the bottle and of course the silhouette uh, that Charlize Theron sporting is almost a true mimic uh, the spitting image of the bottle itself. Uh, it is not um, talking about semiotic analysis. It is not unusual to have a vertical image in the end of a perfume commercial, you remember that those perfumes and fragrances are often uh, aimed at a female clientele or at a male clientele uh, buying, purchasing for their ladies. So it is quite interesting that, and it works all the time, that they always focus on the vertical phallic uh, shape in, uh, in selling the product because this is how the brain connects to power. Well, um, I think that could be, they sh there could be so many other things being said about this commercial. I encourage you to, to watch not only this one, but the one that they actually recently uh, shot where Charlize Theron and other ladies are uh, not on a runway, uh, but are in some kind of um, spa, uh, oriental spa, where everything uh, glitters uh, and it's interesting because we are once again going into the intimacy of women, uh, but women among women, and there is no, uh, once again, no male gaze. So if you have a chance on YouTube, you'll see uh, the series of J'adore Dior. Note, of course, that the exoticism that comes out of this commercial is also due to the fact that they keep, uh, that the advertisers decided to keep Charlize Theron's voice and accent when she says j'adore, Dior, which also, of course helps sell to a global community and uh, empowers the brand on an international scale. My question for you guys, uh, if you want to continue thinking about semiotic analysis are uh, twofold. First, I would strongly encourage you to read a book by psychoanalyst Bruno Bettelheim called The Uses of Enchantment uh, in French, uh, L'Interprétation Psychanalytique des Contes de Fées. Um, this book was uh, a mind blower for me. It just, it literally opened new doors uh, as Bruno Bettelheim uh, kind of um, peels off the layers of uh, stereotypical uh, explanations surrounding fairy tales and give us a Freudian semiotic analysis of uh, what, what is really at stake in those um, fairy tales. So it's a good way through literature, not so much through um, visuals, to get to know how we analyze things through semiotic and often Freudian analysis. And my last um, suggestion would be to go and visit uh, Epinal, which is in the northeast of France, close to the German border. 
an image depinal is uh, a stereotypical image that was used to um, uh, vehicle ideas in uh, uh, in uh, in the pre-revolutionary um, period in France, and uh, from the 16th century uh, to the present time, um, we have used imagery, popular imagery that are uh, part of the collective consciousness. And uh, Le Musée d'Epinal is actually a wonderful way to look into how photography, graphic art, designs, the work on fonts have, have been um, instruments to uh, convey ideas and uh, to convey uh, opinions about uh, the world and about French culture, what we believe in and what we uh, fight for. Uh, I would strongly recommend this visit. The image is a meeting that questions and disturbs. Uh, you remember, this is what Bayarjon has said, and I would like, and I hope that uh, these series of three talks on the art of advertising did question, did disturb you and open new doors and new windows onto what France is all about. I really enjoyed preparing uh, those for you. I hope I will see you again vicariously uh, through recorded or live uh, visual conferences. Um, I had a lot of fun and I'm happy that we were once again reunited. Merci beaucoup, à bientôt.